The following discussion on the implications of the November 2020 election results concerning the alliance between the U.S. and Japan is brought to you by the Crosley Center for Public Opinion Research at the University of Denver's Joseph Corbell School of International Studies and the Consulate General of Japan in Denver. Our speakers are experts in foreign policy and the U.S. Indo-Pacific Alliance. This presentation was recorded on November the 11th, 2020. Enjoy the conversation. Welcome, my friends. Uh, as you all know, we, uh, we had that election, uh, but this is 2020, so you're not probably surprised that we're, we're still uh, debating the uh, results for a, a week. Uh, it will uh, take some time to no doubt sort out. Um, but we believe uh, here at the Crosley Center and DU that it's important to uh, move forward in the transition. Uh, it's, uh, it's time uh, to uh, begin to assess uh, what this all means for uh, our country uh, in terms of public policy, but also for our friends and, and allies. Uh, first of all, let me uh, sort of salute the, uh, all of our uh, American uh, veterans, uh, the families, and the, uh, uh, the members that are uh, with us uh, watching today. Uh, among our topics, as you all uh, can imagine, is going to be a peace and rule of law. And uh, those are, of course, all values that uh, they defend and uh, fight for. Um, so welcome and uh, thanks for your service. Uh, many of you uh, know uh, that this is part of a series of uh, 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 what I called election central uh, programs. Uh, the series began uh, really the 1st of September. Uh, we reviewed uh, a, a number of things, including uh, on November the 4th, we, we did uh, polls uh, at, just after the election uh, and uh, uh, we will update the results today. And I know our guests uh, both uh, have some uh, thoughts on that, uh, both in, in terms of uh, the uh, rather extraordinary election night, but also just uh, in general uh, uh, where things are. Uh, and that's uh, uh, because uh, they both um, uh, are uh, on national television on a regular basis. They uh, 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 talking about uh, foreign policy and they both know a, a great deal about how elections uh, can uh, impact uh, national priorities uh, and relationships. So we're, we're very lucky to have them. Uh, Ambassador um, uh, Christopher Hill is, is of course a, a friend and a former leader of the Corbell School uh, and then later the uh, Center for Global Engagement. He is now the George uh, W. Ball uh, Adjunct Professor at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. I, ha I had to read that, Chris. It's a pretty long name. Uh, this is after a distinguished uh, career uh, as an ambassador to uh, three nations, um, and uh, many of you are aware, uh, working with uh, uh, President uh, Bush and uh, Secretary Rice uh, on the uh, North Korea uh, uh, issues. Uh, so we're, we're very lucky to have him. Uh, uh, just a quick story. Uh, he, of course, worked for, uh, I don't know, at least five presidents, Chris, maybe more, uh, but uh, uh, they were both Republicans and Democrats. And he knew uh, quite well uh, Vice President uh, Joe Biden. So as his position uh, as the, uh, the dean, uh, he um, sort of managed to cajole uh, right during the campaign, uh, uh, Vice President Biden to come and, uh, and give the uh, Corbell dinner speech uh, at, to a very full uh, Richie uh, crowd. And, and uh, we uh, definitely uh, appreciated that. He is, he's now, I know, and will no doubt uh, maybe make some observations, uh, talking to lots of his friends and colleagues uh, in the uh, foreign policy establishment uh, and, uh, and the Foreign Service. Uh, and uh, so we'll, we'll have some real insights today. Uh, joining uh, uh, the, uh, Chris is a Professor uh, Tashihiro Nakayama. Uh, uh, Toshi, uh, to his friends and colleagues, is a Professor of American Politics uh, and Foreign Policy at Keio University, uh, their School of uh, Public Management. Uh, he was here uh, in March of uh, 2019, uh, and he's been here on other occasions, but he was specifically at the Corbell School, uh, 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 fortunately for us, in, a, in a, an incredible snowstorm, as I recall. Uh, at that year, I think you were at w the uh, Wilson uh, Center uh, right. for uh, some period of time. Uh, and I know you've been at Brookings and, and, uh, and have done a, a, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, research and writing, uh, including uh, books on uh, foreign policy, but especially just understanding uh, American uh, politics. 
Uh, one story that I'll tell, and he'll probably uh, expound on it a little bit, is that uh, when I first met him, uh, he talked about uh, uh, his November uh, uh, 2016 experience on national television uh, in Japan. And he said the uh, when I, I, I it might have been Wolf Blitzer, but in any event, the uh, the, the shock of of uh, the election being called for uh, Donald Trump uh, just stopped him uh, for a few seconds. And uh, as we all know in television, uh, you don't stop too much too long on uh, national television. But in any event, I think everybody it was it was a few minutes rather than a few seconds. <laughs> Very good. Uh, well, two minutes is definitely a, a moment. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about it because he just made an observation on what it was like to be on national television uh, on this election night for another American uh, election. Uh, uh, so it'll be uh, uh, a lot of fun to uh, get this going. And uh, as I, I'm going to start with uh, some initial slides uh, to uh, review the election results, uh, both uh, Chris and uh, Toshi will uh, comment. Uh, on, uh, on kind of their thoughts. Uh, I then have one slide on the, the uh, Japan uh, transition, uh, which uh, took place on uh, October the 10th and is now being filled out with the uh, resignation of uh, Prime Minister um, Shinzo Abe and the assumption of power by Yoshida Suga. Uh, and uh, uh, Toshi knows these all of these uh, uh, folks that are in the cabinet and are and uh, exactly what's going on in uh, Tokyo. And so this will be uh, really uh, interesting to hear his uh, early observations here uh, and also uh, uh, with the two of them together as to what the uh, new politics will look like. About 2010, uh, we will uh, take questions from the audience. Please use your, uh, your chat uh, uh, button. Um, and um, oh, we'll have a, a, a Zoom conference here. Uh, They've become the way we uh, do things now, and it, uh, it amazingly uh, works quite well. Uh, Toshi is in uh, Tokyo. It's about six in the morning, uh, and uh, Chris is uh, back east, and it's uh, probably, what, uh, four in the afternoon. Uh, so we're, uh, we're gathered together here. My first slide is uh, 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 Wolf that night uh, calling uh, the election uh, when, uh, after uh, Wisconsin came in. Uh, the person that got a lot of kudos in this election was uh, uh, Mr. King, John, uh, in front of the, uh, the, the big board there. Uh, notice it says the election may come down to Arizona, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Uh, at least two of those were right. As you know, we're still debating uh, Nevada and, uh, and amazingly so, Georgia. Uh, but uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, night there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the election results. Uh, uh, the implications, uh, then uh, Japan, the, the changes there, uh, and then we'll uh, start our general uh, dialogue. So let me go to that first slide. Uh, some of you who are with us on uh, the 4th of uh, November uh, saw this. It's been updated, obviously, and I changed it somewhat because of what I wanted to show, given that we have uh, 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 two uh, uh, experts and people that were engaged in both 16 and 20. Um, uh, I wanted to put uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, and Donald Trump's numbers in 16 together with the, uh, the numbers with uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump today. Uh, that first, uh, the, the first array up there are what we call the aggregators, those people who just basically uh, pull the polls together. Uh, in the uh, case of real clear politics, uh, they really do just do an arithmetic average of uh, what they consider credible polls, uh, probably about the last uh, week, typically um, uh, seven, eight of them. Uh, whereas uh, uh, 538, Nate Silver uh, uses lots of algorithms and a lot of historical data and is a more sophisticated operation, uh, but nonetheless, it's sort of similar. And as you can see, they were both similar and suggesting it was gonna be a, a, a pretty significant democratic victory uh, at uh, seven or uh, uh, five points. Now, when you look at the second array of data, it is not insignificant uh, a victory. It's three points, uh, three percentage points. Um, the, uh, uh, and uh, it's about uh, uh, five million votes, uh, or it is five million votes at the moment. Uh, so as you can see, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's very significant uh, uh, and, and, and larger than uh, Hillary Clinton's, uh, which was two percentage points. Uh, and uh, 
uh, about 3 million votes. Uh, but it's not as, as large as it looked. And notice that Mr. Trump had uh, 304 electoral votes, and at least some projections give Mr. Biden exactly that amount this time. Uh, isn't that uh, sort of uh, unbelievable? And then finally, my array is the forecasters. Uh, they had uh, Biden winning 90%. And, and this time, obviously, they got the right side of it. Uh, uh, Biden did win. Uh, they were probably a little more aggressive in the uh, electoral votes for the most part, except for uh, Cook. Uh, one thing, Toshi, uh, they, they had Colorado. The polls had Colorado correct. Uh, and the forecasters had Colorado correct. But one of the things you said when we were talking um, uh, at the beginning was that uh, while you were very surprised in 2016, mm -hmm. to some extent, the way this, this uh, was presented on uh, November the uh, 3rd, that was also a surprise. Yes, it was. Uh, because after experiencing you know, four years of you know, Mr. Trump, and how he dealt with the uh, coronavirus and the sort of a racial strife in the US, we thought the American people reject uh, uh, Mr. Trump overwhelmingly. So we knew that the, the, the statistics and the studies show that, you know, it could be a slim win by Mr. Trump to a decisive win. I think the, the margin was really big. We more or less thought, you know, intellectually that Biden would you know, uh, 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 sort of establish a, a decent win, but emotionally, we thought it was going to be a decisive win. You know, totally reject Mr. Trump, but that did not happen. More than uh, seventy million people, and that's more than the uh, the votes uh, 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 Mr. Uh, uh, President Obama got in two thousand eight, and more than the number uh, uh, Mr. Trump got in two thousand sixteen. So in a way, I was as surprised uh, uh, this year. Well, I was, uh, uh, and, and Chris way in too, I, uh, that night, just the way the data came in, first Florida, uh, and then uh, you know North Carolina, and how tight it looked like it was in Michigan and Wisconsin and, and Pennsylvania, so negative because the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the first vote uh, reported was uh, the, uh, the vote of the day. Uh, as opposed to this uh, late vote that uh, had to be counted, had to be opened and, and uh, scanned and then counted. Um, uh, yeah, I agree. It, 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 turned, it, it felt like a real nail biter and, uh, and, and that was surprising. Yeah, if you talk to people in Florida, uh, people really in the know, they were saying it was a nail biter and they were saying it's probably going to go to Trump. So it was not surprising to those of us who were here to see it go to Trump. It did not have this situation where uh, a Republican uh, state legislature, as happened in a number of other states, uh, for, forbade anyone from touching the uh, mail-in votes until after all the uh, day of votes were counted. So mail-in votes in Florida were tabulated as soon as they came in. And so we heard uh, a few statistics of that, which uh, frankly, uh, if you're rooting for Biden, we're not particularly uh, uh, positive. I think one of the big problems that Democrats have in Florida is that they are going to have, a, have to have a different message for the Hispanic vote here. Uh, it's not enough, as the Democrats frequently say, to have you know, Blacks and Hispanics. The Hispanics need a, uh, their own messages. And moreover, I think uh, we ought to start understanding that Hispanics are uh, not just one group, there are many different groups. And I think if you look at, at events in, uh, in Venezuela this past year with a big effort by the Trump administration even to stage a coup against Maduro and, uh, and change the situation, he got a lot of kudos from that uh, Venezuelan uh, population in, uh, in uh, Southern Florida. Uh, also the Cuban population, the sense that, uh, you know, uh, we just need to kind of hold our foot on their necks a little longer and Cuba will come along. And so the sense is that uh, Trump was trying harder in Cuba than the Democrats have. Um, I was a little surprised at the uh, Puerto Rican vote of the so-called I-4 corridor. This has to do with an interstate highway that runs through the center there. Uh, we're not more pronounced, but again, we have to await what the, uh, uh, what the analysis was, for example, uh, 
uh, Trump made a big effort in foreign policy uh, to deal with a few places, and one of them was Israel. So did he get credit from the Jewish vote? Uh, I don't think he did, but uh, you know, I think we need to await the analysis there. So I'll, I'll, uh, the the other vote, I'll, I'll be interested in I'll be interested in the military vote. Uh, how did that turn out? Uh, one of the things Toshi said, and I just wanted to follow up while it, uh, while we're still looking at these slides, uh, was that uh, Trump got more votes this time uh, than uh, when he ran last time, obviously uh, when uh, the entire vote was up dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, but the point that makes is that that barnstorming toward the end, uh, I think, Chris, uh, uh, helped him uh, tighten this race up. And I believe when, when the pollsters are done trying to deconstruct what happened here in those areas where they made uh, mistakes, uh, that's what one of the things they're going to find uh, is the, uh, the change turnout model on them uh, was uh, uh, a, uh, the incredible early vote that Democrats managed to turn out, uh, but uh, not taking any way, anything away from Trump in his uh, uh, final barnstorming. Uh, when you look down this list, uh, the one thing uh, that uh, stands out, as you can see, that Hillary Clinton really carried uh, nothing in these these sort of battleground uh, uh, states last time. Uh, she obviously won the overall vote, but uh, uh, that was the reason why she uh, uh, didn't get the 270. Uh, but you'll notice Biden did. Uh, and we're still debating Arizona, but I think as I look at the list, uh, the 13,000 in Arizona, 13,000 in Georgia, uh, the uh, uh, Nevada a vote of 36,000 and uh, uh, and the um, uh, what else are we debating uh, uh, Pennsylvania obviously 47,000 I think we are uh, I, my view is that's going to be very difficult to reverse ex without some uh, incredible legal doctrine that just throws out thousands of votes I, I I'm going to be very surprised uh, and uh, so I, I assume at some point uh, this is going to uh, uh, become difficult to uh, proceed with uh, the, uh, uh, I, I guess that's my, uh, my early read of it, uh, but it obviously is sort of painful uh, uh, to uh, watch it uh, uh, go on. And I think it, it also affects our sort of reputation around the world. I, I know it, uh, it probably uh, with a surprise, uh, uh, Toshi, uh, uh, I was in Japan in, uh, in 2000, and I remember um, uh, many uh, uh, Japanese leaders were surprised then uh, that we couldn't figure the election out. As you know, it, it took a court case on uh, December the, the 12th to sort it out. Uh, I don't know if we're going to go that long this time, but, uh, but uh, this system uh, where somebody wins 5 million overall votes, but yet we're, we're debating, I think I added it up, the uh, four states that are in play right now, uh, Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, and Pennsylvania, there's about 109,000 votes. That, that's what we're debating uh, and not really the 5 million. It seems sort of uh, uh, strange. Can I j jump yes, in, yeah, jump on, in. That, on that reputation? Yeah. Side? Well, uh, I guess it, the chaos it, it didn't really matter because we knew that American electoral system is pretty chaotic, you know, compared to other, it's a, it's a diverse, you know, uh, a system. Yeah. So the chaotic nature, I think that didn't make uh, that much of an impression, but the tone of the election, that was what was very surprising. And for many of the Japanese, uh, you know, American presidential election is a celebration of democracy, like us, including its chaotic nature. And like back in 2008, many of the young people in Japan were inspired right, about what was going on in, in, inside the United States. And, you know, generation above me can, you know, still spot a phrase from uh, Kennedy's inauguration speech. And for like my son, the first president that he noticed, noticed was an African-American president. And so, you know, it, it inspires uh, Japanese people uh, looking at the, uh, uh, and I don't think it's j just the Japanese. I think, you know, you impress uh, 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 the world all over, but maybe this time, this year, for the first time we were looking at what was going on, like the first presidential debates and all the Twitterverse uh, noise and all that, we were looking at the US election with a sense of uh, amazement, 
and sorrow and to a certain degree with a pity. So, and, and that's the impression I got. The interest here was huge. I sort of benefited from it because I was on TV all the time. But, you know, it's, uh, I guess the result turned out okay, but the, the, the whole impression of it, right? The, the, the tone of it. Toshi, think, yeah. Toshi, could you speak to uh, President uh, Trump's popularity? He was very popular with right. Shinzo Abe, but what was the public, uh, what was the Jap if the Japanese could vote, who would they have voted for? Well, that's a diff difficult one. Because the reason why Mr. Trump was relatively popular was because Prime Minister Abe uh, handled Mr. Trump quite well. I mean, he, he sort of totally engaged Mr. Trump and Mr. Trump sort of reciprocated. So we, you know, we were different in that we didn't sort of experience the Trump storm because he was relatively nice to us. And also, if you see what's going on in UK with Brexit, uh, in France with its you know, right-wing nationalist movement, same in Germany, we don't really have that in Japan. So we couldn't quite get the sort of the dangerous side of Mr. Trump. Uh, as uh, in, in Germany or France and UK, they saw in Mr. Trump what was resonating within their own country. And we didn't have that. So we didn't really sense the danger of Mr. Trump. And also the less important thing is that Mr. Trump was tough on China. And that made a lot of difference. Uh, President Obama, he became a bit tougher in his second term. But when he started out with his first term, although he didn't use the term, it was like a G2 that US and China would manage all the important things in the world. Actually, and they everybody... did use the term. They, they did say G2 in the beginning. Did they use the term G2? They actually did. OK. Can you <laughs> okay. Just say, what about the North Korea, Trump's uh, uh, sort of reality TV show with North Korea? That couldn't have been too amusing to the Japanese. That, that was tough. But because it was an effort to uh, 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 push things forward, and an act of negotiation, it was difficult to sort of uh, uh, deny that because at least he had to try out the possibility, but no one here believed that it would work out. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, uh, I put up a slide showing though where the uh, American government is at the moment. Uh, and as you can see, um, I don't believe the Senate will be controlled by the Democrats. Obviously, if they win both seats in Georgia on, on January the 5th, it's possible, uh, but it's a, a long shot. But I would point out that Nancy Pelosi's control in the House, uh, she will end up with probably uh, 228. Uh, she, it'll be down four, uh, but uh, she's very much in control. She obviously has her factions uh, to deal with, but uh, uh, in some ways, uh, so does um, uh, Kevin McCarthy. Uh, so uh, just one last American slide here, and that is uh, that I uh, started uh, the year as uh, probably most observers were uh, thinking that the status quo was quite possible. That Mr. Trump would win uh, or could certainly win as a, an incumbent president, uh, uh, a good economy, a, a big war chest. Uh, the, no one thought the Senate was going to change. And of course, no one thought the House was going to change uh, uh, early on. It was very late in this, uh, Toshi, it, um, when this optimism began to uh, develop. Obviously, uh, the uh, polls had showed um, uh, Mr. Biden ahead, uh, had shown Mr. Biden ahead for uh, uh, several months. Uh, but you didn't see this, the Senate really switching uh, uh, until uh, some uh, polls in uh, September, uh, late August. Uh, and then, of course, uh, that, you know, that thought of a uh, of a sweep, uh, a, a, a blue tide coming in, uh, and um, uh, 538 and Nate Silver, who puts a number on almost everything, uh, puts 70% on it. Uh, but Chris, where we are is uh, sort of gridlock, and uh, uh, you have served under presidents that uh, had uh, were uh, the the uh, you know there was a Senate uh, in the in the, the uh, under the opposite control, um, uh, or in some cases maybe the House. Uh, what's your experience with uh, 
uh, you know, when you've had to either go for confirmations or you've, uh, uh, you've been trying to get policy guidance when, when a government it has a, a level of gridlock, it, it's doable. Uh, but uh, what's your thought about Biden uh, getting it done? Well, first of all, it is doable during my time. I, I had three Republicans and three Democrats. Uh, I went through Republican controlled uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I think three out of five times for confirmations uh, for ambassadors and one assistant secretaryship. So that was not a problem. Um, I worry, however, how uh, this is going to happen. This is going to work right now. And I think a lot of it depends on Mr. Trump's future. Uh, when uh, uh, President elect Biden said yesterday in Delaware, they asked about the Republicans who stay very quiet on this. And you saw him, uh, him pause and kind of look for the uh, for the right wor word. He finally said uh, they appear to be mildly intimidated by Trump. Uh, I think uh, mild intimidation was a uh, very diplomatic turn of phrase, but I think it might be something much stronger. And if it is stronger, I think there will be an effort to really thwart uh, the. Uh, uh, a Biden administration. You recall at the beginning of the Obama administration, uh, Senator uh, McConnell uh, said, well, our, our job here is to make him a one-term uh, president. This was not a particularly uh, uh, nice thing to say right after an election, although compared to today, he was an absolute Boy Scout in saying that. <laughs> so uh, at least he acknowledged him a term. So uh, I think it might be hard. That said, I think Biden uh, really, uh, as much as uh, uh, Trump tried to paint him as a socialist, he tried to, you know, he even did this hashtag Biden criminal family, if you can imagine, uh, all that stuff. I, I think Biden's personal reputation on the Hill will be pretty strong. And let's see if he could get it done in terms of nominations. Some 60% of ambassadorships are either uh, unfilled or filled by, um, how to put it, acolytes of uh, President Trump. So there are gonna be a lot of positions that will need to be filled on the day, the afternoon of uh, January 20th, a lot of positions. So let's see how that's going to roll. Obviously, uh, Biden is a kind of by the book guy. I don't think he's going to do the kinds of things we've seen lately with Trump. I don't think we're going to see acting in front of people's names all the time, which was simply a, a way of thwarting the Constitution, the Senate's right to give uh, advice and consent. Uh, so let's see if he can work on some people, especially some Republicans of courage, uh, uh, such, uh, such as uh, Romney, and see if he can, he can get enough votes. Uh, otherwise, it could be a, a long four years. But this is Biden's, uh, he's looking, this is what he wants to accomplish. He wants to try to bring this um, country together. A lot of people are saying good luck with that, but that is what he wants to do. I, I am at least uh, somewhat initially optimistic. Uh, I think his first steps have been extremely uh, uh, thoughtful, uh, controlled, modulated, good. And as you know, there are forces in the Democratic Party that would sort of go to the mattresses. And uh, so he has been, I think, uh, pretty careful uh, in his rhetoric and moving forward the transition without uh, getting into uh, huge arguments. And as you know, public opinion will be extremely important. And if on Inauguration Day, uh, Trump, uh, I don't, if you all remember, uh, he basically had a 46 negative and a 46 positive, and it got more negative. Uh, he never really got uh, much above uh, 40%, um, and, uh, and uh, his negative uh, uh, went uh, up to about 50, 55%. Uh, yeah. And if that can be different uh, for uh, uh, Obama or, or for uh, Biden, uh, and I think it, it well could be, uh, that will be an asset. Uh, I guess my sense is the American people, uh, sort of like Toshi's um, uh, constituents back in Japan, are uh, uh, both, both a little bit, a little shocked and a little, a uh, little uh, tired of this. Uh, they're, they're looking for um, uh, a moment here of, uh, of quiet and just getting some things done. So we'll see. But at least I'm, I'm at least somewhat optimistic.
so Toshi, I have this uh, last slide and then I'll pull these slides down, but I thought I'd put it up just as you begin to talk about the, uh, the uh, Japanese transition, just so people, uh, our, uh, our friends here who are watching uh, can um, uh, see uh, uh, the, um, uh, both the faces of the, of the leadership and a, and a few names of, I, I picked out just a few uh, uh, ministers. Uh, I happen to have uh, followed uh, uh, Taro Kono and uh, when he was the defense minister and he, uh, he uh, from Georgetown and just an excellent uh, English speaker and all he does such a tremendously good job. Uh, but anyway, why don't you uh, take off on what your, your thoughts are on this transition? Right. Uh, well, there were signs of, you know, uh, uh, fatigue about Prime Minister Abe, although he was rel relatively popular throughout. But for Japan, it was kind of an unexpected because we were used to a, a, a short term, like an annual change of prime ministers. Right? Uh, so he, he went on for almost like eight years. So that was sort of like a fatigue, but not necessarily on his policy. So because so people basically wanted a, a continuation of what Prime Minister Abe was doing. So Suga, uh, Prime Minister Suga sort of uh, symbolized that. So you know, I, I think people are expecting a Abe 2.0 from Suga, although you know, he wants to put his own signs to his, his, his administration, but that's basically uh, uh, where people is at. And whether he would really try to go beyond the Abe agenda on foreign policy? I kind of doubt it because uh, he's, he's not known to be a foreign policy hand. And I think people's interest uh, here as in the United States is mostly about sort of, uh, you know, managing the, uh, the Corona crisis situation. So that's what people are expecting uh, uh, from Prime Minister Suga. And I think he's, he, he's totally focused on that issue. There are outstanding issues uh, uh, related to China, uh, uh, but that sort of is a constant. It, it, it's, it's not like what you do today or tomorrow. So uh, managing uh, relations with the US would be critical uh, 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 in you know, a prime minister's job in Japan. So I believe he sent a message of congratulations to uh, uh, President-elect Biden, I think on Sunday, Japan time. He, uh, you know, all the leaders from other G7 countries like Boris Johnson and, and Trudeau and, and, and Merkel, uh, you know, sent a message. And on the American media, you know, this message from Japan wasn't highlighted all that much, but I think it was impressive because Japan is not, is, is, you know, not known for its quickness. We, we tend to be really, uh, we do the right thing, at a, you know, and a, 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 but it, it, it may take some time, but this time, time around, I think was pretty quick. So the U.S. media could have, you know, uh, was paid more attention to it. But interesting thing was that this message of congratulations was, was he didn't mention what he was congratulating. And I think that was because of the, the, the chaos you have now. I think uh, it's a bit scary to uh, uh, congratulate uh, you know, for being elected. But still, uh, I believe the two, uh, President-elect Biden and uh, Prime Minister Suga is going to have a conversation today on the phone. So. I guess we were relieved, uh, Prime Minister Suga should be relieved because although, like I said at the outset, uh, Mr. Trump was popular, it was very uh, popular in Japan. He was unpredictable and uh, we were not sure what we should expect from his second term. So generally speaking, I would say the Japanese uh, public are relieved and hope that Prime Minister Suga could establish a good personal relations with uh, Mr. Biden. Although, I, 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 from what I've heard from Ambassador Hill, uh, 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 you know, Mr. Biden doesn't play golf and uh, uh, Prime Minister Suga doesn't play golf. So I, I don't know how the two can mingle, but I, I'm sure they can get along. <laughs>
uh, Chris, a, uh, you had a couple of questions when we were uh, sort of uh, first uh, uh, talking about uh, the, um, uh, the, the, this transition. Um, uh, and your, your sense is that um, uh, Biden, uh, his, his orientation is um, obviously, uh, and you've talked about it, uh, for, uh, to build alliances. Um, uh, probably is one of his, his uh, most thoughtful uh, uh, approaches in terms of how to change the game a bit uh, in dealing with uh, China or, or any opponent is to, to uh, once again, take a look at uh, uh, whether it's, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, whatever uh, issue you're dealing with, where are your friends and can you get them on board? Yeah, uh, first of all, I think Toshi is quite right that uh, people didn't know what that second term was going to be because uh, if you look at the base negotiations between the US and Korea, it had been about a billion dollars that the Koreans were providing to the US every year to offset costs. And the Trump administration uh, came in and said, let's make it almost five billion. Uh, and the betting was that uh, this was also going to happen to the Japanese where uh, something that had kind of been going on, some uh, you know, people in the media were, uh, were knowledgeable about the base negotiations. But when you hit something fivefold, uh, you could uh, really attract a lot of public attention to it. And so I am not sure that the US-Japan relationship would have been so uh, so good in a second Trump administration, golf or no golf. But uh, certainly uh, uh, Joe Biden is someone who believes in alliances. He believes in relationships. And you look at his political relationships, they often go back decades. And uh, he is very respectful of alliances and what alliances have, have come through. And so I think you're going to see a little of this uh, sort of Lone Ranger diplomacy. Mr. Biden is known to be a foreign policy hand. Right, because he was the vice right. president, he was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And I think that's all true. But here in Japan, there's a bit of a, a, a different kind of reaction because he's an Atlanticist. He's not really known in Japan. And talking to many politicians in Japan, not much people know him. So I was reading Evan Osnos' uh, book or essay and, and he was saying that world leaders, every world leader knows him. And, and that doesn't really apply in Asia. Maybe he knows Xi Jinping because when he was vice president, he dealt with uh, you know, China. But in Japan, there, are no, there aren't any politicians who has personal sort of relations with it. So although this reputation that he, you know, he literally knows everybody in the world, that may not apply here in Asia. It may apply to the, uh, the transatlantic relations. Right. So therefore, there's a bit of a worry that because he knows uh, uh, you know, Premier uh, uh, Xi Jinping very well and not much politicians in, in Japan, that he might be uh, a bit softer uh, uh, on China than Mr. Trump. My sense is uh, that that will require uh, both uh, who, who's the Secretary of State, uh, who, who's going to be uh, ambassador, and who are the sort of the overall represent, who's right. national security, uh, who are the representatives. Uh, because the point you made uh, in that article I, I made a reference to uh, was that uh, while Obama appeared uh, sort of soft in the first term, I, I think the, uh, much of the foreign policy establishment was waiting for, uh, or probably over, uh, waiting too long for uh, uh, China to evolve, and it wasn't going to happen. Uh, you pointed out that in the second term, uh, they were beginning to move, um, right. and it's sort of a question of, uh, and and I would uh, also add, uh, Toshi, that uh, public opinion in this country has moved tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, it is now, uh, uh, while Democrats, if you do a survey, Democrats will be more concerned about Russia than China. Uh, China will be uh, in a close second. Uh, they now understand that this is a significant challenge uh, that uh, they have got to address, um, and uh, both on the economic side, which obviously the president has uh, uh, emphasized so much, but also on the national security side, uh, whether it's the um, human rights or Hong Kong or Taiwan, et cetera. But go ahead, talk a little bit about your thoughts that maybe they were evolving to some extent. Evolving on? The, uh, the Obama administration was shifting. Oh. 
right. in the second term. Right, right. Well, I guess the whole U.S. China policy was premised on this theory that it may take a long time, but if you engage China, that they will become like the U.S. more or less. I think that was sort of the general expectation. Uh, Japan sort of abandoned that uh, uh, understanding of China much earlier. That we and because of the geo, you know, graphical uh, uh, proximity, Ch China's you know right next to us. We felt this uh, the he hegemonic ambitions, you know, uh, challenging our territories, uh, doing the same thing in, in in South China Sea. So we were, uh, were our perception about China was quite different from that of the, the the U.S. and the Obama administration sort of highlighted that. But as you said, in the second term, uh, uh, they've changed their basic stance toward China. But at the same time, and not that I disagree with them, uh, them but they've maintained a, a, a sense of close cooperation because the understanding within the sort of the, uh, the Obama foreign policy team was that uh, the environmental issues, you know, this issue related to sort of global governance, they are as important and they are existential threat to humankind. Right. And in dealing with these issues, you have to have China on board. So the sense that they have to closely collaborate, collaborate with China was, was there. And I, I, I understand no disagreement with that. If you can separate the competitive side and the right. cooperative side, yeah. but sometimes those two were muddled. That was that was our impression. So, uh, Chris, are you are you uh, connected again? Yes, I am. I, I want to just tell you one thing. Uh, Toshi said to, uh, uh, and you can obviously you you heard what he was saying about uh, if the if the priority, the top priority, is the environment, then then maybe there's a tendency to uh, 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 push aside some of the other competitive issues. But his main his earlier point when you were offline was uh, that um, uh, Japan does not know Biden. Uh, nearly as much as they, they know some other politicians, and he, and he wonders if Biden knows Japan, uh, his experience being uh, uh, kind of toward the Atlantic. But uh, why don't you uh, uh, address that a bit if you have some thoughts on it? Well, first of all, I mean, he's been, uh, Biden's been around for a long time, so uh, he is not known as a Northeast Asia guy. On the other hand, uh, he certainly knows the issues. Uh, so uh, I don't think that's going to be a problem, uh, his knowledge of the issues. I think the problem will be getting the ja Japanese people to get to know him. And so I suspect that uh, uh, Biden will be very aware of that. We'll certainly want to get that going. I think the other thing you're going to see from him is he's a, really an alliance guy. And he, he uh, you won't see him going off to Saudi Arabia as his first uh, overseas trip. Uh, he will that's be true. going off to kind of... Uh, uh, I, I'm not joking, that's what President Trump did. Uh, right. So uh, he will be trying to cement the relationships with these alliance partners. And with respect to China, uh, I think there'll be more effort to try to coordinate what we're doing with China with other countries that have exactly the same kinds of problems with uh, intellectual property and uh, essentially mercantilist trade policies. I, I, I suspect you'll see a lot more cooperation. And finally, I think you'll see a lot more cooperation on the North Korea issue. I don't think he's gonna try to do it himself because we've been there and done that and you don't really make much much progress. So I think there's a, it's probably going to be easier uh, than if uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe were still there with his record setting number of years in that position with perhaps some uh, strong views of where Trump was coming from or where the Obama and Biden administration was coming from at the time. But I, I think uh, it's probably a good thing that there's this perception that the two countries are starting over with new leadership. I will say one other thing though, uh, Japan has not had this full scale assault on every single institution this country has ever produced since, 19, since 1776. They've had people who kind of believe in these institutions, a product, products of these institutions. 
uh, Biden is inheriting a situation where we had a president refer to our media as the fake media, where everything is, uh, you know, the State Department, he called the deep State Department, these kinds of things, these kinds of invectives against institutions. And uh, Biden is going to have to deal with that because that is going to be number one to get uh, uh, to get a U.S. that pulls together and understands that we have a lot of good things in our country and they should not have been all torn down in the last four years. One thing that I mentioned uh, that's uh, somewhat different than the last uh, part of the uh, Obama administration is that I think public opinion has shifted on China, uh, partially the president uh, focusing on, uh, on trade, uh, but just in general, China being much more aggressive, uh, the Hong Kong uh, issue, the South China Sea, other things. Uh, so pub American public opinion has shifted. Um, and the other thing is that, as you well know, Chris, uh, uh, Biden is a jobs kind of guy. He is a Pennsylvania jobs person. Uh, so that to the extent that trade um, uh, is, a, is an issue, he's always going to be trying to uh, uh, protect that. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, th I think that there's some, I guess, uh, uh, just uh, thinking about what Toshi was saying, there's, there are some things that have reframed this uh, that will make it, um, uh, I think, more likely that we're going to focus on, on China, regardless of who's in charge, but generally in the next two, four or five years. As a general proposition, this is not a question of going back four years. Uh, this is a question of, uh, of uh, looking at what the new landscape is. And there's no question China has been much more aggressive. It's not that they haven't had these uh, these uh, territorial uh, claims in uh, uh, islands that have been disputed with Japan for some 50 years, but the way China has gone about trying to assert uh, claims, it's especially true in the South China Sea, where not only making facts on the ground, but making the ground itself by pouring dirt onto atolls and this sort of thing. So there's a certain urgency in this important issue of dealing with China. But I think you'll see uh, in dealing with China an effort to rebuild alliances. And I, I just think uh, we're done with the days when uh, whether South Korean or Japanese diplomats have to stand at the airport waving goodbye to Americans who are going over to talk to North Korea or China and come back and give them a briefing on it. I think there's going to be a lot more, there has to be a lot more uh, cooperation vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis China. And uh, I think um, President Biden or President-elect Biden has also made the point that China is not going to go away. It's one sixth of humanity. And uh, we have very serious disagreements with them, but we're not going to not talk to them. I mean, I think there'll be much more of an effort to, uh, to talk to them. One other point, if, you, if you'll indulge me since I was off the air for a few minutes, I have talked to friends of mine who are overseas running embassies and they said this thing where they have received instructions from Pompeo that you cannot refer to the president elect, you cannot suggest in any way at your embassy that we have a, a new team coming in, that you have to uh, pretend it's uh, business as usual. And as, as Pompeo rather infamously said yesterday, he's getting ready for the second Trump. Uh, second Trump term, this is really holding back our embassies and slowing down what really needs to be a process of acquainting their host governments, uh, in this case, Embassy Tokyo, acquainting its host government, Japan, with the things that Biden is saying and doing and how he's uh, expected to proceed. So I do hope that, uh, I think Jake Tapper on uh, CNN said that the president is acting like a five-year-old whose pet turtle has just died and people are trying to give him some time to get over the death of his pet turtle. But, but this president really needs to grow up and understand that he's lost and acknowledge it, release funds in the G, uh, GSA, you know, all these kind of technical things, start having proper intelligence briefings for the president-elect and otherwise, uh, you know, show that our democracy is alive and well, because right now it's just, uh, to quote the president-elect, rather embarrassing. It is uh, uh, disappointing to see some of our most top officials, Pompeo, Barr, uh, not trying to find some kind of uh, middle ground here uh, to talk about, well, of course, uh, the votes have to be counted, but we ought to proceed forward with uh, uh, what is a, a, a very strong possibility here. Uh, so that, uh, Toshi, is is uh, uh, very disappointing uh, in terms of how this is working out. Uh, one of the things you talk about, uh, Chris, is that the State Department is, and you, you mentioned it earlier, uh, going to need a tremendous amount of work, not only in ambassadors, 
uh, but the department itself. And uh, uh, you were, weren't you, you, I think you were involved with the, uh, the Asian uh, elements of it. Uh, and I assume that's one part, one part of it that, that is going to be, uh, need to be uh, sort of restaffed and rethought through. That's right. I mean, foreign policy is a team sport. Uh, you can't have a president go off there. I mean, mind you, I didn't think having uh, some presidential politics on North Korea was the worst idea. After all, nothing much had been done uh, in the previous uh, eight years. Uh, uh, there's an expression called strategic patience, which didn't seem to mean too much to anybody except, I guess, the person who came up with that term. So nothing had really happened. So uh, in the meantime, things were getting worse. So I understand uh, why President Trump felt the need to get involved. But it just turned into a, just an awful reality TV show with absolutely no follow-up. It's essentially what the North Koreans wanted from the beginning, the opportunity to see our president without having to even discuss nuclear weapons, and then to see our president come out of that first meeting and look like he had uh, you know, learned to speak some North Korean by talking about our, our joint exercises as hostile war games. The efforts of the North Koreans is to get the US out of Northeast Asia, President Trump indicated that that's his desire as well. Uh, we're not going to hear that kind of talk from Biden. And I think that should be very reassuring to the Japanese public, not to speak of the Korean public as well. So, uh, you know, a lot of this kind of messaging stuff can be done by uh, President-elect Biden, but we need a, a, a State Department that functions. We need assistant secretaries who are, you know, visible names. Uh, I, I can never remember the Assistant Secretary for East Asian Affairs, a person who is my successor a couple of iterations beyond, and now I won't even bother. Uh, I hope they will have people who know what they're doing, people who have a reputation, people who that when you're a Japanese official and you have the Assistant Secretary come in, you will sense that when you're talking to an Assistant Secretary, you're talking to the Secretary. This is certainly what Condi Rice uh, in that Republican administration gave the impression to people that when people talk to me, they're talking to her. It's certainly what, uh, what was done uh, during the, uh, during the uh, Obama administration. And that kind of institutional uh, seriousness has to be re regained. And this is the, the issue Americans need to understand. This is a serious business. It's not reality TV. And we've got to get back on track. Uh, Toshi, I want to think that... Uh, uh, I've read that is that during those negotiations, uh, there was very little uh, pre-briefing of the of the Japanese, getting them involved. Um, uh, you know, why don't you? Uh, I mean, just talk about that a little bit in terms of. Uh, let's assume something's going to start up here. What are the lessons right. learned here on, on a better way to do it? Uh, before that, can I be a little yeah. cynical and skeptical about the whole thing? Uh, because that's what you know university professors and intellectuals do right spoil the, the feeling of celebration you know I, I, like i said at the outset the impression that i got from the whole result of the election is that you know there was no overwhelming rejection of the trumpian message right of course you rejected his re-election that that's for sure but it wasn't a overwhelming uh, uh, rejection of the Trumpian message itself. And I think it would linger on in the Republican party. In fact, it would remain the strongest faction unless some other you know, Republican leaders come out with a different kind of message. So you could say that uh, the, you know, the America first message uh, or thinking that uh, Mr. Trump uh, sort of had would, would remain. And that means that at least a, a, a large portion of American people are not that they're re really, you know, strong supporter of the America first message per se, but they're comfortable with it. And the, the message of America first means that America is going to become a normal country without any specific historical mission, right? We're going, we're going to sort of uh, uh, pursue interest as all the other countries would do. So, America upholding liberal international order wasn't af after the after World War II wasn't just about American national national interest. It was about the sense of mission that you're going to shape the world order in the image of yourself, and it was an expression of a uniquely American version of internationalism. And I think that sort of upheld American sort of engagement abroad. 
and that is disappearing. And that is not just a Trumpian phenomena and or, nor a Republican phenomena. I see a more bigger trend in the US going on. So, you know, we're worried about that. It's not just Mr. Trump, but the, the whole general trend about American commitment abroad and, and, and American internationalism. And there was a recommendation by a democratic leaning think tank called Center for American Progress. And this report was titled America Adrift. And they came out with this phrase that the democratic presidential candidate should be using. And it was restrained engagement, right? And I, and as I read that, it almost sounded like we have, you know, Democrats, we have a better version, a sophisticated version of America first. So although we're relieved that Mr. Biden was elected being more of a traditional internationalist, we are worried about sort of the general trend within, within the US. So, you know, it's not that everything will turn out okay because Mr. Biden was elected. I think the skepticism is just stronger. So I, I want, I just wanted to insert yeah, that, that in. That's a, that is a great, great point, Yoshi. I, I, uh, I have talked about the fact that uh, uh, nationalism, which you cited in a number of European countries, but exists uh, in countries throughout the world, um, is a very strong force today. Um, authoritarian populism uh, is uh, a very strong force. Uh, globalism is in retreat. Um, uh, America has isolationism uh, to some extent in both parties. So you're absolutely right. But the interesting thing I would just throw out, Chris, uh, that watching the, uh, the Abe government uh, and uh, uh, listening to their goals on the, uh, the, uh, the Indo-Asian uh, 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 concept, uh, they talk about rule of law. They talk about the law of the sea. They talk about uh, the relationships uh, between these countries. Uh, peace and prosperity. I mean, to some extent, uh, Toshi, your your government under under uh, Abe sort of picked up that rhetoric and began to implement it with with uh, uh, including with the um, you know trying to replace the uh, uh, the uh, the TPP. Uh, well, and uh, uh, so uh, my sense is that to the extent we do something, this is just where I'm at at, at the moment, Chris, uh, thinking about how this is going to evolve. It's going to have to be in a partnership with those countries that want to do something very similar. Now, my, 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 my uh, sense is that Europe uh, is, uh, is also potentially at that table. Uh, but I, uh, would, the one place I would agree with you is I do not see, I don't see the, the will in America to uh, take it on itself. Uh, uh, that would be uh, my thought. But on the other hand, I, I definitely see a sense that, um, uh, and not only just a nostalgia for it, I think the entire foreign policy elites and, and most of the, the, the country recognizes that, that uh, without that sense of, of uh, leadership, um, uh, the, the chaos out there will get worse and worse, and we will be even more on the defensive. Uh, but uh, Chris, jump in. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to say a few points about what Toshi said. I, I understand uh, what he's saying, but I'd be careful not to equate uh, our desire, our firm desire for a rules-based system in the world with this kind of uh, muscular internationalism that we've seen in recent decades. And uh, I think there's going to be, first of all, I think these neoconservatives, as they call themselves, are a completely orphaned group in the uh, in the Republican Party. I mean, I think uh, Trumpism is the opposite of these neoconservatives. What's a neoconservative? You'll have to ask one of them, but it usually had to do with demanding countries behave more like us or else. And uh, there was a, uh, on the Democratic side, uh, Democratic Party side, there was an equivalence in the Democratic Party. It's called liberal internationalism. And it was whenever you know we saw some horrendous situation uh, out there, we should send the 101st Airborne out to deal with it, if not the entire army out to deal with it. And we saw, I remember sitting once in the Balkans, I was the uh, negotiator on Kosovo and I was kind of laying out some of the, the difficulties of dealing with this, talking to NGOs and I had Paul Wolfowitz, I can't remember which 
right-wing NGO he was representing, but basically saying, why are you talking to these people? We know who the good guys and bad guys are. And I was saying, well, you know, it's a little more complicated. It's been going on for a few hundred years. And then I, I had more to Bromowitz from the opposite side. I think he was, he was from Carnegie. Uh, but essentially, both of them saying, what are you waiting for? Why aren't we sending the military? I think the American people really are sick of those kinds of, of, uh, of uh, solutions. And I think this use of military force uh, in, in places that most Americans can't understand, they, they can't pronounce the countries, they certainly can't spell the countries. I mean, it was quite remarkable to ask the American people to send troops off to these places. I think you are absolutely, Toshi's absolutely right, there's gonna be a lot less of that. Trump has certainly taken care of that on the Republican side. He won't even keep troops in an area such as Syria, where clearly our interests are engaged there with Russian encroachment. He doesn't even want us to do things there. So I think we need to fight against, that's old fashioned isolationism. But I think uh, the idea of this interventionism and yelling at people and uh, shaking our uh, finger, wagging our finger, if not shaking our fist, that's over. But I think you can see, you'll see an America that is going to be back, as the president-elect has said, an America that wants to be engaged uh, very much diplomatically. You know, engagement doesn't just mean sending the 101st. It can mean sending a few diplomats. And what this Trump administration had was pure isolationism, no troops and no diplomats. So I, I, I think uh, everyone needs to watch this space in America and understand that things are changing. It's not going back to where we jump into the Balkans or something, uh, even though I personally believe it was the right thing to do. But I think we're going to, you're going to see an America that's going to listen first, ask questions first before acting. Uh, Toshi, one of the things that uh, 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 Prime Minister Abe was uh, tried and uh, never quite got there, was to uh, change the constitution on the military. But in lieu of that, he also invested uh, quite a bit in the military. Do you see that commitment uh, to uh, Japan's um, uh, military, uh, maybe not, uh, expansion in terms of its capabilities uh, continuing or do you see that changing? Well, I think there's a, uh consensus in Japan that, that Japan has to play a more of an assertive role uh, because of the situation that we are we're facing. And uh, there's a consensus here also that US-Japan uh, alliance is critically important. So, and in order to maintain that alliance, uh, we have to be more sort of uh, assertive in defending ourselves. Uh, uh, and that includes uh, increasing our military capabilities and uh, you know, a kind of mission that is prohibited under the present uh, constitution. There is a, a loose uh, consensus on that. But if you specifically come to the issue of constitutional reform, it's still a, a very divided issue. And although uh, for Prime Minister Abe, it was an issue, personally, it was an issue on the front burner, he, he did understand the difficulties. So he sort of pushed that back and focused on the pragmatic side of it, things that he can do. So again, there is a cons consensus with, in Japan that Japan has to be more assertive. As of now, you know, uh, uh, you, you, uh, U.S. Japan in the context of U.S. Japan alliance, U.S. would play uh, would play the role of the spear, and the Japan would play the part of the the shield, right? The, the spear and shield, a separation, but that has to be changed to a certain degree. But as to how we can do this, there's still a, a, a discussion. And as I said, you know, it, 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 Japan is not known for its quickness. But on these issues, I think uh, many of us are trying to start the debate and engage in a conversation. And just simply the fact that we're having a conversation on this issue shows that things has, uh, have changed dramatically. Because uh, for a, a, a substantial period during the, the post-war, pacifism as an ideology was just like a religion. You cannot challenge it. But now you can actually engage in a discussion. So that's a, a big change in, in atmosphere, I think. 
Uh, Chris, I'm, uh, I'm going to go to some uh, questions from the, um, uh, our, our uh, friends, uh, but um, uh, some other uh, comments on, uh, uh, on the uh, relationship with uh, Asia and uh, uh, what you expect out of the uh, uh, Biden administration? Yeah, I think um, if the overall tenor has been that we're dealing with a different situation with the Chinese, I think that's absolutely correct. And I think it is a major challenge but I don't think uh, you'll see a, an unwillingness to talk to them. You know, Secretary of State uh, Pompeo didn't go back there for two years because his feelings were hurt in a meeting there in the fall of 2018. I don't think you're gonna see that kind of stuff. I think you're going to see much more uh, diplomatic engagement. Uh, and I think you'll see much more attention paid to allies. And by the way, that includes tone. And anyone who doesn't think that tone counts in this business, it counts a lot. It makes the words go a lot easier when you've got the right tone. So I think we're going to see a real change. Obviously, the president-elect uh, needs to you know, put together a team. He is not going to have as much time for international uh, issues as he did before because he is clearly dedicated to the proposition that he can improve the overall uh, sense uh, in the United States. Uh, those 71 million votes for Trump would suggest that's going to be very, very difficult. But uh, uh, I don't think this is a man who's ever shied away from difficult tasks. So he's going to have to uh, really rely on a good secretary of state and a whole team of people who are going to safeguard our, our country's interest. And uh, I think he is very much up to it. And by the way, I think there are a lot of internationalists in the Republican Party who will welcome this process and welcome the change, even though they won't say anything. You know, Toshi, we had um, a, a poster from uh, the um, Chicago Council mm -hmm. uh, who does uh, uh, a lot of uh, good uh, annual polling and uh, whether it was the al our alliance strategy in general being uh, pro-alliance, whether it was the alliance specifically with uh, Japan, uh, was it being engaged and being involved with multilateral uh, associations, uh, there's probably support at the 60% level. Now it kind of declined over these four years, uh, primarily because uh, the Republican support went down. And mm -hmm. as you point out, it's gonna be a question as, as to, are there some re, uh, elements within the party that intend on emphasizing that? Uh, but as uh, Chris points out, and as possibly as things develop, particularly um, as international situations develop, uh, I remain uh, uh, sort of thinking that, uh, uh, particularly with Biden's orientation that multilateralism and uh, um, uh, just engaging much more strongly um, as opposed to the last four years is, uh, is, is, is likely to come to the fore here, uh, even with what you, I think, correctly described. Uh, and that is, I don't know if it's an exhaustion or it's just, it's just a different orientation, as you, as you pointed out, kind of a nationalism that has taken hold here. But just to- well, I, I just hope that the polls are right. <laughs> Because yeah. I, I, I do think something different, like, you know, the book being published by Professor Kupchin of Georgetown, he sort of uh, not celebrates, but tries to see a positive thing in this isolationist streak in American foreign policy. And you never heard that. I, I'm, I'm sure he's doing out of, you know, trying to be a devil's advocate. Yeah. But, and, and you see, you know, think tanks like Quincy Institute, which celebrates uh, American non-intervention. And I'm not for all interventions, right? I'm not a neocon or anything. I'm, I'm not a supporter of neocon. And, but you, you see a different trend. And, you know, naturally, because uh, Japan relies on American forward deployment and commitment, we do worry, worry, worry about that. So let's hope that the poll is right. Karen, do we have uh, some uh, questions to take? Uh, we do. Uh, the first one is, what is the risk during the transition, which they perceive as chaotic or distracting, of North Korea taking provocative actions? 
And the same question for China. Last night, I must have listened to two or three uh, uh, different shows, including Mr. Brennan, as usual. Uh, but uh, uh, just a lot of people describing uh, that there is, uh, uh, whether it's the national security apparatus in general, the changes in defense, uh, or the uh, uh, sort of general chaos, uh, that there is some risk out there. Uh, what's your sense of it, having having been there through a lot of transitions and and uh, several decades. I, I frankly uh, agree that there's risk, but I would err on the side that the North Koreans are in a wait and see mode. They want to see what uh, what emerges. Uh, at some point, if they don't feel that they're getting what they want, uh, you may see them start pounding their spoon on the high chair. There's no question they will try to get attention at some point. Uh, if they don't feel that they're uh, getting the right attention. Uh, but I don't see during this time of transition what they would feel they're getting out of this. Uh, what's kind of remarkable about this whole issue is, you know, there are some very serious countries minding the store right now. They include uh, Japan and uh, the ROK. And I think China is not interested in, in starting anything during an American uh, tra uh uh, transition. Russia, I don't know. I don't know. I think they uh, have a much more uh, uh, aggressive notion of how they can affect uh, political thinking and uh, actions in this country. But I think at East Asia, I think there'll be a sense that uh, let's wait and see a little. Uh, Toshi said this was a Japanese thing about being slow. Actually, I think it happens in a lot of parts of Asia. <laughs> Any comment, uh, Toshi, on that question? Right. Well, yeah, I more or less agree with uh, uh, Ambassador Hill. But on China, whether they would actually do something or not, there are worries uh, in, in Japan about sort of China trying to test the credibility of the alliance. Right? Not like in, 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 a, in a major action, but you know, a, a small uh, sort of action, uh, sort of related to some sort of uh, territorial issues, and increasing the number. I mean, they're like continuously sending uh, uh, ships to uh, Japanese territorial waters, and they might increase that. So they would try to shake the uh, the credibility and uh, sort of our reliance on the alliance. But I don't see a major uh, uh, action taken by the Ch Chinese trying to exploit the situation. But but naturally, there are worries because uh, you know the political instability and polarization in general seems to be sort of uh, constraining uh, you know American presence here in the region. Hey, another question, uh, Karen. Uh, yes. What are your thoughts on the U.S. rejoining the TPP? Well, I think, you know, as a it, it, TPP is a Obama Biden agenda, right? So as a general statement, I think uh, we would hear a positive response, but if you actually uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, check whether the TPP, US returning to TPP is high on the priority list, like the Paris Agreement and, and Iran, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, nuclear accord with with uh, uh, agreement with Iran and all that, or returning to WHO. I don't think it's that high on the priority list because this free free trade agreement uh, has, uh, or the uh, the position on free uh, uh, trade agreement within the Democratic Party has changed because of the challenge that is being uh, uh, weighed on against the establishment within the party. You see. The Bernie Sanders wing, the Elizabeth Warren wing, you know, being uh, 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 very sort of critical and, and taking, uh, it has become one of the uh, sort of uh, a defining agenda. So, I, I, you know, if you think of the fact that how the left wing uh, or, or the sort of the progressing wing of the Democrat, Democratic pa Party cooperated with uh, uh, Mr. Biden in the context of the election. I don't think you can put a TPP high on the priority list. I, I don't have anything to add to that analysis. I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, you know, right. uh, we have a lot of things going on and uh, 
you know, when you staff up one of these efforts, you know, the TPP, I mean, unlike the Trump administration, where Trump may think of something in the shower and says, you know, checks with one news person and then goes with it. Uh, that's not how government really works. And uh, boy, the circuits are going to be overloaded as it is. I, I just don't see that happening. And times have changed. I do, I do totally like the, uh, uh, I like uh, that uh, Abe uh, has sort of reconstructed in a way, uh, even if it was less, uh, less aggressive in uh, terms of some of the trade aspects, uh, but it's a, it's a good group of countries uh, to weave together. It is. Uh, and yes. whether it's economic development or mm -hmm. dealing with the coronavirus or whatever it is. And so uh, my sense is that uh, uh, it, has, it has worth, if not, uh, and I agree with Chris, uh, whether it's uh, not only overloaded circuits, but I also think organized labor and, and you know, all the things that you, you described are going to make it a lower priority. It's still a vehicle, I think, uh, uh, to uh, potentially accomplish something in the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Indo-Pacific. Definitely. Uh, we're, we're waiting for U.S. to come back. But I think the political reality doesn't sort of, you know, uh, tell us that's happening. Right. Yes. Good. All right. Another one, uh, Karen. Uh, how is Japan handling COVID, and how does Japan view the virus vaccine? Can I? Well, I'm no expert on the coronavirus, but. At least I think we're handling it better than uh, the U.S. I guess, because there's uh, you know a widespread uh, sense of you know social norm and collective you know action here in Japan that wearing a mask is not a in a, a political statement. I mean, like everybody wears masks. I mean. It's, we don't see it, at, and there is no official government position on masks. I mean, they recommend it. But we're not enforced to, but we wear it for for our families and, and 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 you know our friends and for us as well. So in terms of uh, uh, the number of you know pe people being infected, it's it's much lower than in uh, uh, the United States, but it's a bit higher than other uh, 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 Northeast Asian countries. But still, we're somehow managing it, but we're not sure whether that is because of the policy or because of our social norms, right? But we're okay, but we're extremely worried as well. So I, I think that's kind of the place where we're in right now. Did the economy suffer uh, in a similar yeah. fashion to ours? It, it, it is hitting some industries. Uh, especially, you know, the restaurants and, and, right. and, and all that, uh, the tourism as well. And the Japanese government is trying to sort of help that. But of course, you know, that help is not always enough. So, so yes, in terms of economy, that there are, uh, you know, uh, sectors of economy that's being really hurt. Uh, the, uh, the question included the uh, virus, uh, uh, the uh, rather the uh, antidote. Um, have you all developed your own or have you been working? No, on no, no. We're, we're part of the international effort. So right. it's not that we're doing our own like Russia or China is. We're, we're, we're in, our, the, in, in the international effort in developing that. Do you, do you think that the United States with the Biden government will be able to recover the international ground lost during the Trump administration or will it take more than four years to recover it? Uh, good question, Mr. Hill. <laughs> well, as, as I think we've been saying, it's going to be a little different. It's not a question of going back four years. It's a question of going forward. Um, I think um, Biden will work hard to fix some of the NATO problems. But, you know, Europe, as, as Toshi has said, have, have, have a lot of, uh, had a lot of bouts with their own, their own nationalism. Uh, so some of this is, is, you know, Europe is still very fragile with their own problems with the European Union, Brexit and other things. Uh, but I think the tone will be much improved with our, with our partners and allies. I would like to see some attention paid to uh, countries, uh, you know, the, the global south to addressing uh, 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 global aid to, to these, uh, these countries. I think we'll see some of that. 
um, you know, my best guess is it's going to be a lot better than it is now. And, uh, you know, the way you have to rate problems is are they going the right direction or the wrong direction? I think you'll see a lot of things going in the right direction. I, uh, I would agree, uh, and Toshi, I want you to jump in, but uh, both what you cited, and that is that the surprise that there is such a huge element of people after uh, uh, four years of watching the administration still supporting it, and they're still there, um, and uh, uh, your comment of, uh, and I think uh, Chris's comment that, uh, that almost every institution of federal government has been under assault to some extent, uh, at least rhetorically, and in some cases, uh, uh, in terms of staff and policy, uh, there is going to be, I guess my sense is, uh, uh, a, a longer period uh, needed uh, to uh, change things. And I do, I agree with Hill, uh, uh, Chris, on the, uh, the simply the change of tone and personnel will help. Uh, but to some extent, my sense is that the world has got to see uh, that this uh, country can perform. Uh, it may take a couple of elections, quite frankly, uh, uh, watching, uh, uh, watching us uh, uh, reach some type of a stronger consensus or watching the Republican Party evolve into uh, uh, where they're going. As Chris pointed out at the beginning, uh, if the president is still around uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a force, uh, how does that affect things? Um, and uh, uh, social media, I mean, all the things that are that are affecting us uh, as a as a uh, the developed world, but particularly America. Uh, so I think it may it may take a while. I I remain optimistic because I just think that uh, uh, if you're if you're committed to uh, 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 sort of a uh, a moderate uh, liberal uh, democracy uh, markets, I mean all the things that have created this this incredible prosperity and peace, uh, you've got to sort it your way through it somehow. Otherwise. Uh, uh, we could be into a very dark 1930s period here. Uh, Toshi, what, some thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess, you know, American political system uh, can only function in a healthy manner if you have a too healthy, you know, party system. Right? But as you see now, uh, the Republican Party has to sort of rebrand and re redefine whom they are. But you don't really see that. It's being overwhelmed. It's being overwhelmed by this Trumpian uh, 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 strand or the Trumpian thinking. And unless the Republicans take into their hand seriously defining what they're about, I think U.S. would uh, face difficulties. And I was always for Biden's election because not that you know, I can't vote anyway, not that I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of Mr. Biden, but because uh, I think Biden being elected would be much more healthier for the US because if Mr. Trump had been elected, it would Trumpify the Republican party totally. It would discredit moderate wing of the Democratic party because they've tried uh, uh, Clinton in the 16 and tried Biden in 20 and didn't work out. So therefore the Sanders wing, you know, the, the squad wing, which they have doubled, right? The number I've heard would become much more strong. So the divide would be bigger and, 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 and you can't see America recovering. Whereas in the Biden, Biden's win case, you could expect a sort of a redefinition effort within the Republican party. So in order for America to return, to come back, I think there has to be a serious effort within the Republican party to redefine themselves and uh, keep a healthy distance from, you know, this America first or, or Mr. Trump's ideology. Uh, sobering thoughts, any, any uh, final uh, comment, uh, Chris? No, I agree with all that. I think uh, the Democrats have some real concerns. Uh, you know, a lot of this is rooted in campaign financing. This is how our system works. And uh, that has to be looked at. And moreover, I think you have these people in these 100% safe districts who are coming up with policies that just don't work for people who are in battleground states or uh, contested districts. And, uh, you know, there's a piece in the New York Times, an interview with Connor Lamb, guy, uh, congressman out in uh, Allegheny. And it 
just was just chilling to hear his comments about how AOC is, you know, every, you know, she talks about stuff that's just not going to help him. So one could see an even more divided America unless these parties start dealing with these problems. I, uh, I agree. The interesting thing is that in, uh, in the Arizona, for example, in, uh, in Colorado, which are, which are sort of what we would call the new South, Toshi, Toshi uh, the, this is the area of the country that, that Democrats are doing uh, much better. Uh, and they are uh, animated by uh, lots of young new voters who just flooded into this 100, uh, uh, we're going to see 130 million or 160 million uh, of voters of which about 15 million of them are new, um, I think uh, uh, is a, another factor, however, that I, I believe sort of could pull us toward a consensus. Mm -hmm. But what a great conversation and thank you for joining us. I, I know you have a, a speech to give shortly and a, and a class and, uh, uh, and I uh, appreciate your uh, coming on uh, uh, given as uh, early it is in the morning, you'll be getting breakfast here. Uh, 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 shortly in uh, in Tokyo, and thank you, Chris, uh, for uh, joining us. Uh, a, a fabulous conversation. I want to thank all the friends for uh, being with us. Our staff, uh, Karen, uh, uh, thank you for helping put this together. Obviously, DU, uh, the uh, Corbell School, because of their commitment to engagement, uh, they're the people that provide uh, this platform, which we uh, so uh, uh, greatly appreciate. Um, and uh, in particular, the uh, Consul General. Uh, of uh, the uh, uh, of Japan here in uh, Denver, who is so constantly supportive uh, of this program and which there will be uh, more of it. Uh, professor uh, for uh, joining us. Uh, and uh, Chris is a, a professor uh, at uh, uh, Columbia now. Uh, and thank all of you. Uh, you have a, a great uh, uh, Veterans Day and uh, I will see you again here shortly. Floyd, I, I just can't let you go without, without thanking you. I mean, you, uh, you have put this together with this terrific, uh, terrific center you have at, at Corbell. You're a real player, too. I mean, anyone who knows anything about uh, Colorado politics sure knows about you. You're on TV all the time. You're not on TV because you're just making stuff up. You know stuff. And so I think it's a great honor for all of us to have the, have the opportunity even to see your slides too. So thank you. Uh, thank you for all you do. You're really terrific. Thank you, Chris. I, I second Ambassador uh, Hill's statement. Yes, and Ambassador Hill for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you, Toshi. We'll talk, we'll talk again. Bye. Thank, thank you. you everybody.